Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the seventh meeting of the Welfare Reform Committee for 2015. Could everyone please make sure that mobile phones are on silent? Uh, agenda item one is our first item of business today, and it's a decision on taking item three in private. Item three is consideration of the committee's participation in a future Parliament day. Do the committee agree? That's agreed. And that brings us to agenda item two. Uh, this is oral evidence on the impact of welfare reform on children's services. When the welfare reforms were first introduced, concerns were voiced about the direct and indirect impact that they would have on local authority budgets and delivery. The aim of the session is therefore to establish whether these concerns have come to pass. Uh, as noted, uh, it will focus particularly on the impact on social work and children's services. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, our witnesses today who are going to help us uh, understand this uh, subject. They are Alistair Gaw, who is the Vice President of Social Work Scotland, Stephen Brown, Head of Services at Children, Families and Criminal Justice at North Ayrshire Council, Richard Gass, Welfare Rights Manager at Glasgow City Council, and Margaret Kinsella, District Manager, Care and Learning at Highland Council. Um, do you want to make some opening comments uh, to the committee from your experience so far? I don't know if you've already, uh, discussed how to do this, but I'll thank you for the, the invitation. We hadn't, I hadn't prepared, personally hadn't prepared opening comments, uh, Chair, but um, I think probably the first thing that I would say is it's still relatively early days with welfare reform, and, and I suppose our uh, main anxieties are for the future rather than necessarily what's happened up until now. I think the, uh, the major impacts will uh, continue to develop over the next, uh, over the coming years. Um, but um, we do certainly have concerns about uh, potential impact. Two areas really. One is impacts on outcomes for children in relation to, because we know the links between poverty and poor outcomes for children are very strong. Um, and that would be issues around health outcomes, um, their educational achievement and attainment, children's growth and development, their overall well-being and, and confidence can all be negatively impacted by poverty, and there's an extensive literature on that. Um, but also, I suppose, the other area for me um, uh, is, is to do with the cost, potential cost shunting of pressures moving from the benefits agency and, and, and DWD budgets onto either local authority or health budgets to meet the needs that arise through the reductions in, in, in welfare. Anyone else have anything they want to say before? Stephen? Thanks, Chair. I, I, I think for, for us, uh, Alistair's right, it's, it's very early days, but we have certainly seen an increase in um, child protection registrations related to parental mental ill health. And um, over the last three quarters, certainly in North Ayrshire, that's been very significant. Previously, um, parental substance misuse and domestic violence have been the two main risk factors identified, but certainly we have seen a huge increase in parental mental ill health. That's not bipolar, it's not schizophrenia, it's adults in distress, and that's obviously having an impact on their ability to look, to look after their children. Margaret, do you want to say something? Uh, yeah. My comment really at this stage would be that, as Highland was the pathfinder for universal credit, I think we have had to very quickly come into um, a lot of multidisciplinary work, which has been successful, what is being successful. But equally, I think that the scale and the um, speed at which the universal credit has been introduced, which has been relatively slow, hopefully hasn't lulled us into um, a false sense of um, everything's going to be all right, because I think as yet we are still anxious about what lies ahead. Richard, do you want to make a comment? In, in relation to demand, there's been a, an increase in demand for welfare rights and money advice type service, and for that type of advice from, from social work staff, there's not been a, a, a huge increase in uh, the, the costs for, for social work department in Glasgow, but there certainly has been a, an increase in demand for the, the extra services, the benefit type advice. Maybe to, to set the ball rolling, I'll just come back on that, that point that, that Richard has just made. Um, third sector organisations in particular who are involved in, in the front line, if you like, of, of some of these uh, issues have started to indicate to us just exactly what you had said, uh, Richard, that there's a, a, a clear signs that um, uh, you know, information and advocacy uh, is, is, is coming under real pressure. 
Um, how have you noticed um, yourselves um, departmentally whether that's happening to you? Um, and can you quantify that in terms of how that would then impact on third sector organisations? Uh, is there some correlation between that? In, in, in Glasgow, uh, welfare rates and my advice for non-social work services is provided by the third sector. We do try to provide that in-house through our social work staff. Uh, there's been, a, I would say, a general failure on claimants to come forward in relation to matters of sanctions. Uh, I don't know if, there, if there's a, a, a reluctance to come to a social work department and announce that there's a, a sanction in case that opens up some, some concerns. They're maybe better happy to go to the, the, the voluntary sectors for that information. Uh, Just anecdotally, because you, you mentioned that, it was put to me that there are... I mean, this must come from casework, um, because I don't think people would make this up. But there, there might be some reluctance on the part of people to come forward, because there may be some concern that they would be considered neglectful of their children if they're having to come forward and ask about financial assistance, various other things. And can that put people off actually coming forward? I imagine that could put people off coming forward. I can't give you evidence that that is in fact happening because they don't then come to social work and declare that to be so. Uh, but we, we, we know that there are, there's just, in relation to sanctions, there's a large number of sanctions decisions affecting service users, but the service users are not, by and large, seeking that information or support from, from our own department. They are, there's, there's folk coming forward looking for referrals to food banks, because sometimes access to the food bank requires a, a, a counter signature from a, a duty social worker. So the, the, the farms are coming forward for that purpose. But there's still a huge number of folk not challenging their sanction decisions. Hey, Margaret, you're nodding there. I think, Stephen, you wanted to make some comment as well. So I'll come to both of you. It's, it's interesting because the experience in North Ayrshire has been slightly different from, from what Richard's describing. We've certainly seen a 500% increase in destitution presentations through our service access. And um, probably about 40% of those have been related to sanctions that have been imposed. So people have been coming through. The numbers are, are not huge. 500% increase, though, since um, 2012, we have seen. So last year, we were 500% up, and, and you, you probably talking um, approximately 400 presentations over the year in terms of destitution. So the, the, the situation in North Ayrshire is slightly different. We've, we've certainly seen people coming forward and, and coming through social work to make those, um, to ask for the support. So. In terms of social work, I, I can't really speak, but certainly <coughs> in terms of um, housing services, uh, we were involved in, involved in supporting a discussion with tenants where it was very clear that people were reluctant to talk about their money problems and sanctions until the very last minute. And so you know, by the time they were presenting and seeking help, they, it was much more difficult to, uh, to, to support them. So I think one of the issues that we have to look at is how, how we engage with, in that instance, with tenants, but more largely with, with clients, on how to uh, reduce the, their anxiety about uh, approaching services for, for assistance. Um, based on what you've said, Stephen, again, uh, evidence is starting to emerge from, from people that we've been talking to, but you, you talked there about the, the large uh, percentage increase in the, the amount of people coming forward. That must have an impact on frontline staff. Does that mean that the, the frontline staff are having less and less time to deal with more and more people? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, anyone else experiencing that kind of pressure? Alistair? I, I think certainly um, our, um, I work for the City of Edinburgh Council and the City's put together a very strategic uh, multi-agency approach to uh, tackling some of the issues that have risen out of what's a massive change programme around um, welfare benefits and our uh, advice shop and our services and the voluntary sector partners that, that, that support it are uh, certainly increasingly busy as a result of that, there's no doubt. Um, but we've also seen a huge increase in demand for emergency um, support. I think that does relate to sanctions and, and, and uh, when people's circumstances change, the system seems quite slow to respond, in, in, in my view. And that means that um, we've seen a, a tenfold rise in demand for food banks, for example, over the last 
two or three years, um, and um, that that's now become a mainstream part of social security in the city, which is, uh, um, you know, clearly um, a big change from a few years ago. Okay. I'll open up to members of the committee. Before I do, I noticed that a couple of you have um, been pressing your buttons uh, to, to come in. You don't have to. Um, the, the broadcasting will, will take care of that. So, Claire, do you want to um, kick off? Yeah, th thank you, and thank you for your introductory remarks. Um, <coughs> obviously, the, the committee has been taking significant evidence on the effects of welfare reform, and um, we are aware that it's perhaps the tip of the iceberg in terms of what's coming down the line. However, um, Harry Stevenson, the President of Social Work Scotland, wrote an article in the Scotsman in February of this year. And if I could quote from that, he says, there's lots of well understood routes out of poverty that governments will be working on. Income maximisation, increase in pay, suitable benefits, affordable childcare and the removal of barriers to education. But these are for the long term. We are facing a crisis now. Do you agree that there is a crisis now in terms of the increased demand, particularly in the area of child services? Stephen? Yes, I, 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 I would. Certainly from, from our point of view, and I'm, I'm very careful not to make the direct link between parental mental ill health and welfare reform, but you know, anecdotally, we are certainly hearing from a number of parents who have been coping and clinging on um, the changes in benefit systems, sometimes not even when those changes have come into force, but the anxiety around that has, has certainly tipped them over from being you know, coping parents into a, a, a situation of crisis. A, a bit like, like Alistair said earlier, we are attempting to identify problems as early as possible. We have based some of our money advice workers in the early years centres in North Ayrshire, attempting to remove the stigma from people coming into social services, for example, to try and provide that advice. But again, you know, it's, it's very early days and it's difficult to know yet how effective that is being. We are continuing to monitor the progress of that, but um, it's, it's about finding people where they are to try and provide that advice. But certainly, the the increase in um, parental mental ill health in terms of child protection registrations, the increase in adult protection concerns. So we have adults in distress presenting an accident emergency on a regular basis. Again, in North Ayrshire, that's increased by 293% over the last 18 months. So quite significant. I, I, I would not want to make the direct correlation, but, but the argument could be made. I think the, the anxiety that... Um, not necessarily knowing what the welfare reform was going to mean to, to individuals and to families has, be, have, has been of great concern to, to families. A bit like um, Stephen's saying there, you know, for some families it might not have been as overwhelming as they thought, but it, it has taken a while to get to that position. So um, I think for me, not knowing how this was going to affect people has been of major concern to them. And I think, as, as, as Stephen says, that the, the, the tip into, uh, from coping just about into not coping has, has been painful for, for families. I think there is a sense of, uh, as measures un, unroll, there's a kind of ratcheting effect and, and there, will, there will probably be a tipping point. And I think that's what Harry was getting at, really, that in, in some areas that's, that's probably hitting. Uh, and I think it probably does affect, although the, the, the implementation is, is um, largely universal, I think it affects different areas in different ways. For example, in the city of Edinburgh, we have quite a large population um, from other parts of the European Union, particularly Eastern Europe, and there's been quite a lot of migration into the city in, in, in recent years. Um, and what we've found, and it's very, very early days, but what we've found, uh, and uh, Richard may know the technicalities of this better than me, but um, since... Uh, uh, April, um, there's been a change in the access to housing benefit uh, for EU nationals, and we've got a number of situations already where um, single, uh, particularly in cases where there's been issues of domestic abuse or, st or distress within families, where um, women uh, who've had to flee domestic abuse are not entitled to any housing benefit um, if their children are under five, and as a result of that, um, they're destitute 
and we're having to look at putting some emergency situations uh, solutions in, in in place and um you know that's just been what that's one example of of of, of changes and i think Rather than it being one sweeping change, it tends to be this ratcheting effect that that, that, that does lead in different areas to a crisis point at, at, at different times. Richard, the situation you've described there, and I would agree that that, that is, is a problem. And what you have there is effectively a cliff edge where someone has support one day, but the next day they've got no support and they're looking for a, a, a somewhere to, to to go to get that, that that assistance. The other aspects of the reforms, which are that kind of sneak up on people is the fact that benefits aren't increasing at the same rate they used to and somebody maybe doesn't notice overnight that their, their money isn't going as far but over the months they're maybe not able to replace school clothes, uh, retake it bedrooms etc etc and after a period of time there, there's, there's, there's aspects they require assistance with uh, so it's, there's more Stealth, perhaps, is the wrong word, but the, the, the reforms are, are creeping up on people in, in that way. Uh, what we're about to move into is the, well, we've started now, the migration of DLA to personal independence payments. And we'll see there that people who have benefit one day will not have it the next day. And that will then present us with some of the more cliff edge scenarios. Yeah, I think probably just, if I could just <coughs> follow that briefly. Um, there's also the traditionally a lot of families have used perhaps one benefit, say G uh, JCA or, or tax credits, to pay their fuel bills, and then perhaps the next week or the week after would use that money to, to get the food in, and, and, and that would feed the family. And if there's a sanction on one of those, or if there's changes around those, that can you know that's all it takes for, for things suddenly just to, to fall apart, and then they're at the they're at the payday lender um, borrowing money, and then it's just a downward spiral. I mean that's actually quite a common um, situation in our experience. Yeah. If we could just ask um, specifically about children's services again. Obviously, um, in the article as well, um, the, it mentions that child, child poverty actually calculates that there are 220,000 children living in poverty in Scotland at the moment. Uh, obviously, the government has a, a, a strategy with the Early Years Collaborative and with GIRFEC to make this the best place in the world for children to grow up. Um, what pressures are, are those competing effects having? It? Is this damaging the uh, impact of the early years collaborative work and GIRFEC in terms of the pressures on child services? I think the um, pressure on children's services is really quite immense. Um, and I've spoke to uh, members of the Family Nurse Partnership who obviously are dealing with a very specific group of uh, young families. You know, that, um, and their evidence was that um, it's, it's really had quite a major impact on their work and the, the, the um, experience of families in that they've had to get to know more. You know, is this bit about previously uh, they, as, as health visitors or as midwives working in the family nurse partnership, they didn't need to necessarily get so involved in, in checking out where uh, the, the young women were with their, their benefits. So in, in that regard, it has had a major impact. And certainly um, the health visitors as well and the, the early year support staff are finding that they need to be much more mindful of the need to check out where the families do need uh, to be signposted or supported and particularly mindful of perhaps literacy and numeracy issues. And coming back to us saying that there are real issues there, as has been said around going from, the anxiety about going from weekly or fortnightly payments to monthly payments is major. You know, that people are budgeting, they're budgeting, you know, they may be budgeting very well on a very limited income, uh, probably better than I could, but the idea of then stretching that to monthly is, is just very, very difficult. And certainly housing are saying that um, they're encouraging people now to um, seek changes. Because I understand now that you can, that the, the landlord can seek to have uh, rent paid directly to them uh, in the way that private landlords have been able to. So again, you know, we, we, we're having to look at ways of, of dealing with a very difficult situation. Um, but certainly, yes, it has, I think, had a, a quite considerable effect on early years. Okay. Kevin and then Margaret. Um, thank you, convener. Uh, Mr. Gaw talked at an early stage about cost shunting, which is uh, an issue that this committee has um, discussed on numerous occasions. 
And I wonder if I could maybe tease something out with yourself, Mr. Brown, because you were saying that there was a 500% increase in presentations of destitution, um, that the, you were dealing with much more child protection orders. Can I ask you, in terms of, take for example, a child protection order, uh, where you may have a family who has lost a certain amount per week, which has led to the kind of worry that we've heard about today, which leads to a case of, of, of mental health difficulties and then the child protection order being put in place. I know it's very difficult to give us uh, an average, but what would a child protection order cost? What's the minimum cost of a child protection order? Have you any idea? It, 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 it is very difficult to cost that. We, we know that if a, if a child is on the register but remaining at home and receiving fairly intensive supports, then um, probably about three years ago we did an exercise in North Ayrshire to cost that, and it, it was approximately um, £22,000 per year per child. Um, if we accommodate a child, it, it, depending on, on the placement, it, it could be anything from £400 a week to £2,500 a week, depending on, on the nature of the placement. So it, it can be fairly significant. Very significant sums compared to um, the types of savings that are being made, um, so-called savings that are being made uh, because of welfare cuts in families. Would that be fair to say? I would suspect so, yes. Um, in terms of some of the work that has gone on previously by social work services and others across the country of um, the costs uh, of dealing uh, with uh, individuals because there have not been early interventions and there have not been uh, the right inputs at the right times in their lives, it may well be, would it be fair to say, that after this child protection order has been put in place, um, that possibly the kid has been taken into care, that outcomes in the future might not be so great as well, which may have a cost in the state? Yes, I, I, I think we would all recognise that um, at the point where we have to accommodate a child, the, the, the potential for positive outcomes for that child reduce. I, I, I think there's no doubt about that. So in, in reality, um, what you're saying is that these savings, these welfare sanctions, these benefit caps may actually, at the end of the day, cost the state a huge amount more because we have not ensured that a family and their children are given the best outcomes at the very start. There is no doubt that the earlier intervention and prevention methods that we are attempting to put through and put in place, there is no doubt that the work we're doing in early years and the um, early years collaborative, um, all of that work uh, tends to be much more effective in terms of outcomes for children and their families, but also cheap, more they are more cheaper. They're cheaper. Um, sorry, they're cheaper than um, some of the high-cost crisis interventions that we have to put in place. So there is no doubt that if, if we can move upstream and, and provide the right support at the right time for children, not only do the outcomes improve, but actually the costs on the state reduce. I, I wonder if we could hear from others too, um, convener, because this cost-shunting idea um, is not, in my opinion, just about the shunting of those cuts onto other bodies to deal with it. It seems to me to be a cost, a human cost shunting over the period of somebody's life uh, in a number of cases. Mr. Goh? Yes, I entirely agree. Um, the, again, if we talk about the city of Edinburgh, but we're certainly not unique in this. Um, we've been working hard to uh, make the city um, the best place for children to, to grow up in and to give every best, every child the best start in, in life, including children who whose parents rely on um, benefits or who are born into very difficult circumstances. Um, and uh, we have had substantial success over the last uh, few years in reducing pressure on the numbers of looked-after children and, and shifting the balance of care so more children can stay with either their own parents or their own extended family. Um, but um, it is a concern that um, if the um, services are under pressure, um, for a number of reasons, it might be to do with population and demography growth, it might be to do with changes to um, benefits, 
but if those efforts are undermined by the kind of uh, circumstances that uh, Stephen is describing, for example, in parental mental ill health, then that undermines that strategy and the, the, the knock-on effects um, economically could be very, very substantial. Um, the, um, I think that the, the association between uh, poverty and neglect is one that um, is complex. There is a literature in this, um, but what is undoubtedly clear, wh whatever the causal factors are concerned, is that um, children who grow up in poverty have substantially less good outcomes, and therefore they are much less likely to be able to contribute positively uh, to, to, to society in the longer term. So the more we can intervene earlier, and the more we can make sure that we narrow the attainment gap, the achievement gap, um, for children and get their health outcomes, and I think uh, Margaret touched on literacy, which is a very good way of doing that, for example, then um, the more we can reduce those, those risks. Um, I think there's certainly, uh, there would certainly be value in doing some more uh, analysis and some more modelling of, of, of those potential costs. I wonder if we could hear from Ms Kinsella, please, convener. Um, as you, you might appreciate, Highland has a higher level of, of employment than, than obviously a lot of local authorities in the central belt. So um, the issues that we face or that families face can be somewhat different. And I think it's interesting to look at the, the issue of uh, rurality and employment. I, I was in preparing for today, I was speaking to um, colleagues who, who remarked that, for instance, in Portree, uh, on the 31st of March, you might have... Um, forget the figure now, is it 900 people who were signing on on the 1st of April? That's down to nine. You know, that, that seasonal employment is, is so significant. Um, and, it, it, you know, again, that, that's, we, we're having, we're expecting families to be very financially sophisticated in, in managing money. You know, from one day, as has been said, you know, to be relying on benefits and another day then to be in work. And we're told that the, the welfare reform will be um, real time. Um, and so people will need to manage their, their, their claims uh, through um, ICT. Um, that can be very difficult in certain parts of the Highlands where we don't get, uh, you know, certainly up on the North Coast, um, broadband, etc., is very, very poor. At the moment, that's it's almost being mollycoddled along because we, we've been a pathfinder. People have been... Um, very supported very often, one-to-one um, -one, uh, discussions with DWP workers. But uh, I think our anxiety is that um, when there's considerable migration across to real time, that there will be considerable problems for, for families in maintaining their, their claims up to date. Um, sorry, that's straight off the, your particular issue. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair enough. I'm, I'm glad to hear that as well. You talked about financially sophisticated uh, people have become quite financially sophisticated. Well, you have to be. I, I'm not yeah. suggesting, you know, that, that you know, if, I, if I'm managing on a very, very limited income, um, I have to be very mindful of that so that, you know, how many people in this room would know where to get the cheapest tea? But you could be knocked off your stock quite quickly. Absolutely. I remember a, a, a number of years ago when I was paid weekly and suddenly got a job which paid me monthly. Um, during that period of time, you know, I got myself into some... Uh, we difficulties, of course. Uh, I had uh, the the good luck of having uh, parents that would bail me out at that point, but often folk don't have the ability to be bailed out. So even these changes of weekly payments, fortnightly payments, if we've heard, to monthly payments, can can cause great grief to folk, can they not? Absolutely. And so an example is um, if you if you've got a job and uh, you need to find childcare, very often childcare providers will expect a month's money up front. So although you might be getting the 600 hours uh, nursery entitlement, you will perhaps need to top that up. So again, how do I find a month's um, deposit on my childcare when I'm not going to get paid? Uh, and at the same time, I have an anxiety about my benefits stopping uh, while... Uh, before I get paid, so, so you know, whilst a lot of um, a lot of uh, thought has gone into how to make stepping into work more straightforward, and appreciate that you know we don't necessarily have the 16-hour rule, there are still considerable anxieties for for people with small children who who get a job, uh, who are acting responsibly, who've sorted out their childcare, and then are told, sorry, you'll need to pay the balance 
uh, a month's deposit in advance. So quite where do they go if they're not fortunate enough to have a mammy who can, can help them? Um. In terms of, uh, and I think a couple of you have touched upon this, um, the reluctance of folk to seek help um, particularly where there are children that are involved until the last minute, because obviously they have a fear that there may be interventions with their children which um, they don't want, want to see, really. Um, this fear um, that seems to be permeating uh, about welfare reform, what can you guys in the front line do to try and deal with those fears? Or is that impossible unless we have a real hard look at, at terms of, in, in terms of things like sanctions and conditionality? Mr. Goh? Um, I think there's a lot we can do. Um, I, I, I mean, I think the, um, the, the, some of these fears are, um, are justified. Um, I, I, you know, if you think about what does a child need to actually grow and develop and thrive, more than anything else, the child needs security and predictability. Um, and in some cases for these families that's exactly what's been taken away from them is the homelessness for example you know if they're threatened with homelessness if the family's moving around if they lose their accommodation these are just the things that small children do not need um, having said that there is a lot that can be done uh, if we go back to the example of food banks um, and um, where uh, families are first coming into contact with kind of crisis support is at places like food banks and the food banks are getting much better now at integrating services. So you're trying to develop one-stop shops so that if, if somebody's coming to a food bank because they're in real distress around the need to, to have food for themselves or, or, or very often their children, um, you can actually make sure that at, at that access point you get um, advisors who can give them support and help to do with either money management or access to debt advice, citizens' advice bureau, whatever it happens to be. Um, but you can actually have people there on site who can take away perhaps some of those fears and anxieties uh, and actually help signpost people and, and, and take them uh, t take them into services that will actually make a difference. So I think uh, through good integrated coordinated services, a bit of a strategic planning above that, but good integrated coordinated services and making sure you've got the right people available at the access points so that somebody's not just coming in and getting a, a bag of food. Um, they're actually getting the help and advice they need while that's happening. That, that, that's, that's a simple example, but it, that kind of thing can make a real difference. But life would be much easier, I'm sure, for you guys if there was no sanctions regime in place and conditionality was changed. Would you agree? Yes, absolutely. Mr Gass? Yes, absolutely. Uh, sanctions are a, are a major problem, and as I said before, no folk are not challenging decisions for, for a number of reasons. Some of the steps we've taken in, in Glasgow to address that is to create a, a sanctions pack which we've made widely available to food banks and to other organisations because we need to impress upon the individual that the sanction decision is something that they have a right to challenge, that it's important to challenge. Unfortunately, when someone's been sanctioned with the the way the media has portrayed benefit claimants of over over recent months that a sanction equates to a blame, that they're now to blame in some way for not having their money. And to come forward and put their hand up and say, I'm to blame, is not something that people generally do readily. So we need to have a, a, a culture change in terms of folks' right to, to challenge a sanction. Uh, you're absolutely correct. If there was no sanction regime, then this would be a far easier uh, task. Mr Brown? Yes, as I'd said earlier, of those um, increased destitution presentations, uh, approximately 40% are directly related to sanctions, and, and there is no doubt that that's putting additional pressures on individuals. And, and many of those sanctions have been imposed as a result of um, individuals who have mental health difficulties, who have substance misuse issues, who are already very vulnerable for various reasons, and, and um, when they miss appointments and, and have have money cut, they become doubly vulnerable in, in, in that way. And if, if there are children involved in those situations, it's very difficult. In relation to the, the issue, and it goes back to, to Alistair's point, I, I mean, I think there are things that we can do to mitigate against some of this. I think we, we have made um, efforts, certainly in North Ayrshire, to base multidisciplinary teams around our early years and, and, and again, reducing the stigma of walking into a social work department so that 
parents can can actively seek advice without necessarily the worry that somehow their children are going to be removed as a result of that. Um, as I say, it's very early days in relation to that in terms of success or otherwise, but, but we would hope that people seem to be taking the advice on it in a way that would hopefully prevent them requiring the assistance of food banks in the first place or, or getting themselves into difficulties in, in terms of finances. But we are beyond just maximising people's benefits now. Um, it, it's, it's about financial capability, so it's also about linking them in with um, credit unions as opposed to payday lenders and, and you know, the, some of the, the white goods sellers who charge exorbitant rates that nobody in this room would, would, would dream of paying, but can be enough again to tip people into real hardship. Taylor? I think that uh, what's been noted is the, the variation in sanctions, so that I can think of one particular office in, in Highland where they seem to have a much higher sanctions rate than other parts of uh, the area. So that, I think, we, you know, we need to look at, or somebody needs to look at why, why that is so. Maybe there's a very late bus arriving in that particular town, I don't know. But, uh, you know, it, that, that is of concern because it shows a certain level of um, decision-making being, being perhaps uh, not quite right. I think the other side of it, which is about how, how social work services, like Stephen, um, well, children's services involves both health visiting and social work staff, uh, complemented by, by um, support staff. So I think we've worked very, very diligently in um, having that um, attitude with folk, which I think hopefully our, our clients know is, is, is as supportive as we can be. So uh, I think that gets away from the idea that, you know, if you, if you um, start to, to share some of your, your, your worries and anxieties and difficulties with social work, then the first thing we're going to do is, is remove your child. Uh, you know, I think those days are hopefully long gone. Uh, and I think that the, the, the support given through Early Years Collaborative and others is, is a key way into that. And I think that, um, for instance, some of the work that we've done with midwives still in the NHS at looking at how we can support families has been really very interesting. Uh, that's using Early Years uh, Collaborative methodology. And we're now looking to do that same, um, what we're calling is money health checks, uh, because you know evidence shows us that people will not seek help until the last minute, as we already said. So we're trying to come back from that and say, look, where are you just now? What sort of support can we give you? And looking to do that now with primary one children, so keeping that, that message in universal services so that we can attempt to encourage people to, to, to share their difficulties and get help sooner. Very briefly, finally, convener, uh, do you have any evidence that the reforms are having a greater impact on families with disabled children? I've not seen, I, I mean, obviously, with uh, disabled children are still entitled to the benefits, that the children's benefits that have, have remained unchanged. Um, so that, that, that's not an area specifically where I've seen issues as, as yet. Um, I think um, where you, you, uh, we do find issues is that often children with additional support needs um, and disability um, where social worker are involved or where you have families who have a, a multiple range of issues and problems um, and, and, and that's where um, I think the additional stresses and uncertainties around the changes um, of the, to the benefits and the security that families have had um, can then um, exacerbate problems, for example, if there's a, a disabled child in the house or a child with autism, for example, that can, that can be much exacerbated by these other, other pressures. But I've not seen anything specifically in relation to children with disability. My colleagues might have examples. Don't, don't, don't have examples as such, but just a uh, kind of warning that with un un universal credit that the disabled children, households with disabled children, will be significantly worse off. At present, the, the benefit system would give a disabled child premium for any rate of DLA, and that's about £60 a week. Any rate of DLA or PIP under universal credit will only attract £30 a week to get the higher elements. Someone will need to be on the highest rate of care component or on the highest rate of daily living for, for personal independence payments. We will see, as universal credit extends to families, uh, uh, a problem there. I would also suggest that in relation to sanctions, if there's a, a family with a disabled child, then the extra needs of the disabled child will undoubtedly impact upon the parent's ability to 
attend to perhaps the, the, the issues they put in their, their claimant commitment. And too many claimants feel that when they're signing their claimant commitment, they've got to basically agree to everything and not recognising that, well, someone working, yes, can afford childcare, but someone not working can't afford childcare. So you will be at the school gate if you have a disabled child then you might not be able to be at an appointment for half past nine. And I think we need to have a greater understanding for claimants that the claimant commitment is something that needs to be revised before they're held to account for failing to uphold something that was impossible. Thank you. Uh, following on for, from Richard's point there, uh, evidence that, that was given to me was uh, the issue of um, having to seek work. Um, and it's that measure between having a child who, with a diagnosis and having a child who doesn't have a diagnosis. Uh, so, uh, you know, for, for my child to attend the after-school care, it might be that actually the after-school care people say they can't manage because of their behaviour. So my ability then to seek work becomes compromised. Uh, and th having to seek work, the, 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 the age at which your child needs to be before you seek work is, is reducing. Uh, and so there's, there's a complication in there which... Um, very often single mothers, is having to think about, well, how can I go out to work when nobody will look after my child because of undiagnosed but very real uh, behavioural issues? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Uh, before coming to Margaret, um, uh, Claire indicated that she wanted to have a supplementary on a point that Kevin made. So. Well, it, it, it was, was on the issue of sanctions, obviously. Um, <coughs> uh, not unsurprisingly, it has... Um, uh, come up a number of times this morning. Um, I suppose a concern for me as a member of this committee is that we keep hearing about variations, about you know even the use of language. It's a threat of a sanction and the way it's been implemented. We've had concerns from the PCS union about pressure on staff to actually uh, impose sanctions on people and even the written evidence from, um, from Social Work Scotland today gives a number of case studies where um, uh, you know, um, the sanction was overturned at appeal, but nonetheless had significant and um, very, very severe impact on the families involved. Do you think, would you welcome a, an independent review of conditionality and sanctions at this stage to actually address some of these variations and some of the, the problems that we've been hearing about at the moment? A very helpful thing, the sooner the better, if not yesterday, because... Uh, the problem with the sanction regime, if we can call it that, is that when people don't challenge decisions, then poor decision making is almost condoned by the lack of challenge. And it, it, so it goes. And what we need is either a review to correct the errors or a, a proactive challenge to decision making so that incorrect, ridiculous decisions can be stamped out. Is anyone else? Yes, I, I mean, I would agree in Scotland, certainly support that. Um, uh, I think particularly where uh, parents have responsibility for uh, vulnerable others, whether that's children or others that they're caring for, I think there, um, there should be some uh, recognition of that um, uh, in, in a much more positive way than there is at the moment. Okay. Okay. Right. Come back in. There was a, a statistic from one peer in Scotland, which you've perhaps seen the... the, the projected a, uh, an annual figure from information they received through Freedom of Information and they estimated 9,000 lone parents in Scotland being sanctioned over 12 months, 6,000 of them on income support, which means that those 6,000 would have a child under the age of five or a child with a disability such that they were then a carer, the other 3,000 being on job seekers allowance. So that's a, quite an alarming statistic. Yes, yeah. We'll come to Margaret to be followed by Annabel. Thank you and good morning, panel. Um, I mean, obviously, all these welfare reforms and, you know, what we've heard today and in previous evidence is it's putting a lot of pressure on local authority budgets, as she's said, and uh, very much so on the demand on social services in particular. Um, but I was interested to hear what um, Stephen Brown was saying around the parental mental health and the impact that that obviously has on children um, because if parents are in distress there is a knock-on effect so and this obviously the welfare reforms are in part uh, the cause of that 
So, and obviously the, the main concern is the well-being of children, and that's got a long-term effect on these children. So, as, as Kevin had said about, you know, it's a false economy to see that, you know, these changes will actually save money. But um, I just wondered if, you know, the children are being... You know, you said there was child protection orders the increase in that. So what happens then if a child is taken into care? And I know that's the absolutely worst scenario. But because of all these pressures, is there enough foster uh, parents available? And are there enough um, places available in children's homes? I know, I mean, these are all the la very last things you look at. But, you know... If there is this huge increase uh, in the pr on the pressures on parents, is that support there um, to to help the children? Difficult. Um, we have certainly had a, a pressure on our fostering service as a result of this, um, or certainly a result of an increased number of children being accommodated. Um, we have had the unfortunate situation where we've had to um, house some children in some of our, our units at an, an earlier age than we would ordinarily like. Um, so some of our children's houses have accommodated children as, as young as seven or eight, which is far from ideal because of an absence of um, appropriate foster placements and uh, it, whilst we are continuing to begin that process of trying to move upstream and it goes back to, to something Margaret was saying earlier on that you know the ideal situation is to prevent parents tipping over the edge and, and, and to help continue their um, progress in, in terms of coping and, and you know the, the work we're doing around the early years but I think there are also opportunities around the named person role in the new Children and Young Persons Act. Um, I, th I think there is work we can be doing with our colleagues, our, our health visitors, our midwives in relation to upskilling them and giving them um, the, the right skills when they're engaging with families and parents to identify where there may be issues and where they can signpost people on. So, uh, you know, uh, we're a long way shy of that yet, I think, but, but certainly the direction of travel is there and I'm, I'm hoping that we'll, we will see some improvement as we, as we move to take some of the pressure off. Quite apart from the pressures on the local authorities, it's the impact on children and, and you know, whilst we, we work hard where we do have to um, remove children from parents for, you know, where the risks are, are so great, we do work hard to return them as, as quickly and as safely as possible as well. But but any, any time we have to accommodate a child, the, the um, effect on both the children and their parents can be um, significant. There's no doubt about that. In Glasgow, there's a, a, almost a continual campaign uh, to recruit additional foster carers just to ensure the resources are there uh, to, to, to meet the demand. But I wonder if there's a, a, an issue with if, if people are in a kind of financially precarious position themselves. Would you then choose to come forward to take on the responsibility for a child? So perhaps the, the, the economic climate is a, is a barrier to folk coming forward. But certainly in Glasgow, there's a, a campaign on currently to recruit additional foster carers. Um, I can speak for Edinburgh. Edinburgh, we have a, we have a thousand children uh, in the city of Edinburgh who are accommodated, and they're either in foster care or uh, with kinship carers or, um, or in children's homes. Um, the majority being in, in foster placements. Um, and we uh, continually struggle to, to, to find enough foster parents. We work very, like Glasgow, we work very hard at it and we find ourselves actually quite often competing with our neighbouring authorities or, or with other fostering providers. Um, but there is, um, uh, there is definitely a, a need for more foster carers in, in the country. Um, there's no doubt about that. Um, but there's 18,000 children in the city of Edinburgh who are living under the definition of poverty that, that, that's in the paper. Um, and so most of the children who are affected by poverty are living with their, their own families. Where we think there's uh, room for uh, development here particularly is to support kinship carers. Um, and we, we've had some success in that, but we would like to see many more circumstances where if, if children can't live with their parents or, or parent, um, they can at least live with their extended family and have supports around that. Um, and I think, but I, I think one of the problems we have is that some of the impacts of um, of the changes to the benefit system are actually having a negative effect on on kinship carers. And certainly, 
uh, grannies or uncles or aunts who give up work to look after children in those circumstances, which many do, um, are finding that, um, the, generally speaking, we're not that great at, at, at supporting them, whether that's at a national or a local level. I think there's a lot we could do in those circumstances. Yeah. Um, could I just continue on? Well, Kevin wanted to ask a supplementary it, on a point. It's, it's on that point of kinship carers, convener, um, and I, I think you'll remember uh, that when we visited uh, a housing association here in Edinburgh, uh, who were looking at the impacts uh, of direct payments and the bedroom tax, uh, we spoke to a number of kinship, kinship carers at that point, one in particular that I remember very well, who was extremely concerned about the impacts on her income of being able to re remain a kinship carer. Um, and I just wonder, uh, you've mentioned that that is a difficulty. Is that a difficulty throughout the country? And have there been withdrawals uh, from kinship care because of threats um, to income because of welfare changes? I can't say that there's been withdrawals, but certainly there's a, a, an increase in anxiety. And I think it's interesting if we go back to before the bedroom um, tax was, was in, introduced, before the, um, the discretionary payment was introduced, we were very anxious that foster carers might have to um, withdraw from being foster carers. Now, as it turned out, when we looked at it more closely, we didn't, we didn't have any families who were affected. But I think for me, it shows the anxiety amongst professionals that what did this mean? You know, so, so a considerable amount of time was, was then spent in trying to establish whether or not this would have a negative effect on, on our um, foster carers, which in the end, fortunately, in, in, in our circumstances, it didn't. But it, it just goes to show the, the, the amount of, of anxiety that amongst professionals and amongst services that, that, that it can cause. And equally, I think, amongst kinship carers, having read the papers here today, I'm not personally aware where it has affected um, kinship carers, but I know it has increased their anxiety about how will this affect my, my money if I do you know, uh, um, take my, my grandchildren in or my, my sister's children or, or whatever. So it's certainly a, a, an increased level of anxiety amongst families as well as an increased need to be very much on top of things for, for professionals. <coughs> There was a, a, an adjustment to it to allow one extra bedroom for, for kinship care households. However, if a, if a carer was to take two children, then it might not be desirable that they're sharing a bedroom, yet the, the, the concession within the, 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 the legislation was to allow only one extra bedroom. The way that kinship care can actually be afforded is it's a, a, a mixture of... Uh, DWP, HMRC benefits in conjunction with the payment from the local authority that adds up to a, hopefully a, a reasonable sum. However, under universal credit, we will find that the, the bit that really was the same as tax credits may no longer be payable to kinship carers. And uh, it may, that may be something that the Scottish Parliament can, can, can address in terms of its legislation so as to ensure that what we have in place in Scotland does entitle folk to uh, the maximum benefits from from the, the, the benefit system. But at present, we, ha we, we have a, a, a bit of a crisis coming forward for kinship carers who move on to universal credit. Okay. Okay, okay. Can I, can I continue? Margaret, yeah. Thank you. I, um, just along the lines of, you know, there is this perception perhaps by the UK government that uh, it's uh, people who are unable to work for one reason or another um, but it's their children that are suffering um, but it's not just people who are out of work. Um, does anyone have any statistics on how many children whose parents are in work who are actually now um, you know suffering from this uh, you know, the mental health problems and all this distress as a result of the changes in uh, welfare benefits. Because it's not just people who are reliant solely on benefits, it is people who are actually in work as well. Certainly talking to uh, my housing uh, department colleagues, that, that they are, uh, I, we don't have statistics or, or hard information, but certainly they are starting to, to look at the, um, the impact on 
families in low pay and certainly feeling that at the moment, if you like, we are quite rightly putting a lot of um, time, effort uh, into uh, understanding welfare reform and the effects that it will have on clients. But in the, in the meantime, we do need to, to keep looking back into the needs of those families on low pay. Uh, because I think there is anxiety there that, uh, you know, if people are on casual hours or zero hours, I appreciate we're, you know, moving to, to, um, to, to not have zero hours, but people are on, it, it can be very much a low pay um, economy. And so we do need to, to be mindful of um, making sure that those folk also have access to appropriate support and services. It's certainly the, the case that um, frontline staff have, have spoken in increasingly of, of in-work poverty. There's, there's no doubt about that. And um, as, as Margaret said, it's, it's very, very difficult to um, quantify the, the levels. It's, it's, it's much easier when people are, are, are claiming benefits and we can count those and we can be very clear about, you know, where the, the, um, the deficits might be in terms of income as a result of X, Y and Z in relation to welfare reform. It's much more difficult with, with in-work poverty. However, um, certainly anecdotally, it seems that that's, that's an increasing feature. I don't have any statistics for you either, but it's, <coughs> it does appear in reports you know, that f the use of food banks is not reserved to folk out of work. It's working families that are using food banks. And just the, the fact that the, work, the term in-work poverty trips off our lips so easily shows that it is, it is a part of our common language. The problem being that the additional costs of being in employment, getting to and from work, laundering clothes, lunches at work, etc., not to mention the, the, the huge childcare costs, it just means that the, the extra money that's earned from employment doesn't go towards meeting all those needs. So someone, because they're in work, doesn't necessarily mean that they are, at the end of the day, any better off and indeed will be, in many cases, unfortunately worse off. And that's not going to hugely improve under universal credit. Mm -hmm. Could I just ask one more question? It's around um, appeals, which I mean, uh, one or two of you have mentioned that people are not actually using the appeal system uh, as well as they might. Um, and quite often it's the third sector that would help uh, people with their appeal, you know, citizens' advice, for example. But I know from my own experience that uh, citizens' advice is absolutely inundated with people and you know it's an appointment system now where it used to be a drop in and um, and they would you know historically have taken forward appeals to help people uh, what has been done to actually help the voluntary sector to deal with this because obviously there's a greater load going onto the voluntary sector now because of this uh, I know the social services are trying to deal with it and some of them you know, have got their own um, welfare rights offices and everything. But quite a lot of people would prefer to go to a third sector organisation than going to the council um, for assistance, particularly around rent arrears and that kind of thing. So um, what assistance and support has been given to the likes of third sector organisations to help deal with the huge increase in clients that they're now having to see? Uh, in, in Glasgow, we've got a, a, a welfare rights appeals team within social work who will take uh, referrals from, from the voluntary sector. And we work in partnership with the voluntary sector. Now, indeed, some aspects of the voluntary sector will provide tribunal representation and additional funds most recently over the last 18 months and for the next 18 months have been made available through Scottish Legal Aid Board. So in Glasgow, some of the local citizens' advice bureaus had additional resources from Scottish Legal Aid Board to address the, 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 what was the perceived increase in appeals. In reality, the volume of appeals hasn't increased. We, we anticipated that. We were perhaps wrong in that respect. There might be a number of factors as to why the appeals volumes haven't increased. There was the, the long delay in making decisions on new personal independence payment claims. There was the parking of ESA claimants while the ATIS contract was renegotiated and the fact that folk have a, a general reluctance to, to challenge a sanction decision. They may explain why people aren't lodging appeals. There is also the mandatory reconsideration process which was introduced to try and bring down the number of appeals. However, we are not 
convinced that the number of folk who would ultimately won at a pure tribunal are getting that level of decision at reconsideration, yet for some reason the folk aren't going on to appeal. So appeal numbers are down, additional resources have been made available via Scottish Legal Aid Board, and what I can see is in Glasgow that we work in partnership with the voluntary organisations that the individual client can see the advisor within the CAB, but when it comes to appeal representation, if that bureau doesn't have the resource to do it, we can represent the person at the tribunal and they can be reassured in advance that this is not the, the, the state interfering with their, their benefit. Yeah, I think a lot of local authority areas, through, either through community planning partnerships or through establishing their own strategic approach to addressing issues around uh, benefits change, because it is such a massive change process, have, have looked to join up very much and work in partnership in this way. So they'll set a set of strategic objectives around reducing the impact of you know, homelessness, for example, uh, trying to maximise income wherever that can be maximised. Uh, doing some work around workforce, how you upskill your staff groups, either from the local authority or from the voluntary sector, joint tra training programmes, making sure the right advice is available to people in the right place, developing the one-stop shops that we've talked about, making sure resources are aligned. Um, there's a huge amount that community planning partnerships or taking a strategic approach at a local level can, can, can do to actually... Um, uh, mo bo both mitigate against the impacts of the changes, but also um, look at um, providing uh, the kind of uh, support that you're describing, where the voluntary sector would be, would be the port of call at, 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 uh, at, at first base, which can be a much less threatening. Well, quite often, it's um, it, it's done through food banks and church groups, for example. Um, but all of you know, I think the important thing is that if community planning partnerships or um, a strategic approach within a local authority area to wel the welfare benefits issues is taken, um, then you can make sure that people are properly trained, they have the knowledge that people need, and they can take away a lot of that that fear factor. Um, and th there's a lot of work going on across the country to to, to, to do to deliver that. Yeah, but I mean, if, sorry to interrupt, but if sanctions are increasing. Uh, and the appeals are actually not increasing in line with that. We must be missing out. You know, there's, we're missing a trick somewhere, and the message is not getting out to the, um, the clients who are being sanctioned. Or how do we overcome that? To find out why people aren't challenging the decision in the first place, and if it's back to one whereby benefit claimants are part of the problem and if you've been sanctioned then you are the biggest part of the problem. If someone feels that that's the position they're in then we need to understand that and then empower them to, to overcome and to, 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 to see the appeal through which I don't have an easy answer for but it's probably going to involve working at community group levels so that individuals who are are sanctioned don't feel that they're, they're isolated, uh, that they can speak to other folk who have been sanctioned, realise that the decision that they're facing is not one that's uh, perhaps going to stand up, that, they, that there is prospect of success. Thanks. Did you want to come in? Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Margaret. Uh, Annabelle, to be followed by Christina. Um, convener, thank you. Good morning. I've been struck by the number of times in which you've referred either to intervention or early identification of a problem. And um, I was interested particularly in, in Ms. Kinsella's submission uh, because that laid out a whole range of processes and procedures that were all about collaboration, consultation, information. Um, and interestingly, because your area was to be a pathfinder for universal credit, you said specifically there was multi-agency and service collaboration in an attempt to understand what, what lay ahead. Can you just describe in a little more detail what that was, that, that whole process, who was speaking to whom? Um, probably in the first instance, it, it, it was Chief Execs and Finance very concerned about the possible implications of rent arrears um, from their tenants. Um, so, you know, the, they were wondering how much, how, how big this hole was going to be. And, and um, as a result of that as well, um, and uh, uh, Children's Services saying, well, how is, how is this going to affect us? Um, coming together really... For instance, uh, as a result of getting it right, um, 
we already have very close working relationship, particularly between housing and um, children's services around the issue of, of um, possible homelessness and evictions and such. So at a local level, people know each other very well and understanding um, the financial difficulties that families can be at, I suppose, on a very practical level, we said, we need to speak to you. Uh, and they were equally saying, we really don't want lots of people becoming homeless. Uh, we want to ensure that our tenants understand their responsibilities uh, in terms of uh, the rental changes. Um, and we, we need to work together to, to um, ensure that tenants are, are mindful of, of what, what could come. So as a result of that, um, housing were sought to under, un, uh, be involved in a, a major consultation with, with their tenants about the best way to uh, inform and uh, update, uh, update them involving ourselves from children's services as well as adult mental health services because we've all got the same clients, basically. So um, it, it, it was in everybody's interest to ensure that uh, our clients, our tenants, um, our, our service users were fully as, as aware as they could be of, of what was going to take place. And at the same time, we, we saw particular... Um, routes, multi, multidisciplinary routes, to better understand where we need to, to direct particular support. Uh, I think the, um, the, some of the examples of work, for instance, the maternity services uh, piece of work that, that we got involved in emanated really from the early years collaborative, where people were saying, well, what is it that you can do? You know, I'm mindful from, from housing where people were saying, you know, I don't necessarily want to be labelled as a problem. I don't necessarily want to um, let you know of my difficulties. We, we struggled very much in trying to um, reduce the, the stigma of, of not managing. And so we, we very much focused on um, providing, appearing to provide support at a universal level. So earmarking, for instance, a woman's booking appointment with her midwife. Every woman who's pregnant gets that booking appointment. Now, as it turned out, most of the people who got the support were those people either on low pay or on, on benefit. However, it, wasn't a it, it, it didn't necessarily appear a stigmatized service. We, we did have people who um, were in work, in good work, and everybody was offered the ability to, to have what we called a money health check. So that was... Um, Minimal piece of work for midwives. They were very clear they did not want to be involved in the 15-minute rapid appraisal of somebody's benefits. It was very much a just, here's something, move you on, uh, but at, at, which was offered to all pregnant women in, in a particular town and which we're now going to roll out across Highland, knowing in reality we will be uh, impacting on those people either on benefits or in low pay. Um, so, and looking now to uh, develop that into primary one. So using the early years collaborative of, of small tests of change, looking at the issue, but also very much trying to present this as a universal offer to reduce the, the, the as has been said already, the, the sort of feeling of, of, of inadequacy and guilt because I can't manage on money that nobody can manage on. Um, so, Yes, that's one of the approaches that we're taking. And that it's being rolled out, I presume. It's being rolled out across you're, Highland. You regard it as a very positive process. It's we regard it as, as a successful way mm -hmm. to, to impact on people at particular points in their lives uh, where they might need additional support. And I think what's happened there as a result of that, they go back and they tell the, their next-door neighbour or their pal or their sister that actually... They're not as bad in there as, as we thought they were. So it's, it's also reducing uh, the stigma, as we've heard already, of um, yeah, social work just uh, are the big baddies. We're mm -hmm. not necessarily the big baddies. And, and so, in, in effect, we're trying to use that as a way of changing perhaps misguided perceptions of, of, of what services are. It's only out of that you can pick up possible referral routes that the, the individual may be unaware of. For example, I was interested to see that um, you've had local authority requests to DRBP for direct payments, for example, uh, direct um, rental payments. Um, and was that recognising that that would help some individuals and some families 
with their budgeting? I think that's been a major concern for, for social work and for housing, as, as um, the, the member spoke about managing, going from weekly, fortnightly money to monthly money, and that idea of having a range of income, of a range of money coming in at different times. Um, and no, the anxiety of, of falling into rent arrears. If you go onto universal credit, you automatically, automatically go into rent arrears because it's paid in, in, in retrospectively. So, you know, you're immediately into five weeks rent arrears. Uh, if I missed a mortgage payment, I would find it quite difficult to pull back on that. Um, so, it, that, and I think we, we'll wait and see. It, it's difficult because um, we don't necessarily want to take a blanket approach to everybody who's uh, on benefit, necessarily the local authority or the landlord seeking fortnight, uh, fortnightly rental payments or the, the, the rent being paid to the, the landlord immediately. But when we speak to tenants, that's what they want. The, the majority of tenants actually are very anxious about managing this money from, from weekly, fortnightly, and your rent being paid automatically to getting this this sum of money into an account on which I now have to balance everything. And a lot of tenants would prefer, maybe in, in, in the short term, maybe, uh, to, to have their rent paid automatically to their landlord. Um, and it's quite how we manage that, recognising that a lot of the, the welfare reform is about uh, the argument of, of personal responsibility. But if my personal responsibility says, I can't manage all of this money, and I would like you to take this element away, and I can manage the, I will attempt to manage the rest. Well, maybe that's personal responsibility. No, that's very helpful. In amongst all the engagement, the consultation, um, partnership initiatives, what was your relationship with DWP? Did you manage to engage with DWP? Uh, there are monthly... Uh, meetings between DWP and the local authority and although I do attend them I must admit their business seems to be much more with housing and um, chief execs than, than ourselves but uh, maybe we just haven't got onto mutually uh, useful agenda items. So that's every month? Yeah. There are meetings with DWP and to avoid the gentleman feeling excluded <laughs> but I was just interested in the submission from Highland Council. Um, from what you've heard, I mean, are these examples of practice being replicated in Edinburgh or North Ayrshire or Glasgow? It, clearly, in terms of the um, liaison meetings with the DWP, those happen, and I, I would assume they probably happen in, in, in most areas, and, and we attempt to, to raise issues and, and identify problems as, as early as possible with them, and, and some of, sometimes those discussions are very fruitful. Um, in relation to... These meetings take place for North Ayrshire? I... I, I, I Exactly, I'm not sure, but, but monthly probably isn't f far away from from the mark. I would have to say, and um, but I, I suppose more widely than that, I think as as welfare reforms rolled out, and you know, Alistair spoke about it earlier in terms of that ratcheting effect, I, I think. All public services are, are continuing to try and keep their finger on the pulse and be responsive and make sure that every time something else is introduced, we are um, clear about what the potential implications are and, and that we continue to work together as, as public bodies to try and find the, the, the most sensible solutions moving forward. And, and inevitably, that cannot be, be done simply on a, a social work basis or simply from a, an NHS, or a, 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 it requires a whole system approach to it. So I, I, I think probably what I'm hearing from, from Highland is, is very similar to what goes on in North Ayrshire and I would be surprised if it were different elsewhere. Yes. In Glasgow, until recently we had bi-monthly meetings with uh, a universal credit team from, from DWP. Since the announcement of a go-live date of 8th of June for Glasgow, there's been a, another group set up in addition to that that meets on a monthly basis, but we've not yet introduced universal credit yet. Yeah, outside of that, we have <coughs> probably quarterly meetings with, with the DLA PIP, Personal Independence Payment uh, team, 
and that's on a more on a more district basis. So Glasgow, the, the North and South Lanarkshire, and East Dumbartonshire. And at these meetings um, on this issue of sanctions, I mean, is that is that if you thought a practice was developing where claimants were um, being adversely affected by the application of sanctions, is that something you could raise at these meetings? We, we have raised it at the meetings and the sanction pact to which I referred was, was shared with the DWP staff who attended the meeting and felt that the pact was, was, was very so that helpful. Was a, you, you talked about a sanction information pact, yes. Mr Gass, is that what that... The sanction like? information yeah. pact was, it's a, yeah. it contains just a description of the claimant commitment, it has the, a, a standard letter should somebody seek to cover a reconsideration and some more, some more information. But that was shared with the, our colleagues from DWP who kind of welcomed the pack as a, as a helpful tool. No, that's helpful, thank you. And Mr Gaw, I don't know, in, in relation to Edinburgh, are you able to, to speak? Um, yeah, I mean, Ed, Edinburgh's very much tried to have a, had a, a, take a strategic response to welfare reform, um, and so there is multi-agency discussions around the table on a regular basis, and that includes uh, regular communication with DWP, who've come given presentations and issues around sanctions, for example, are, are discussed. Um, so I, th I think that has to be the way ahead. I, I think that um, if organisations can work collaboratively, then um, th there are a lot of solutions in place. Um, uh, just picking up on, on, on Margaret's point, I think that, um, that the issue about, about sanctions is that the, um, the, 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 the problem that we have, particularly for social work and for vulnerable children, is that often the people who are impacted uh, are the ones who are least able to manage the... Uh, the degree of personal responsibility that the new system um, expects. And clearly, uh, there may be many people through the implementation of the changes who will uh, build their own capacity around personal responsibility. Um, but there are many, many people who the social worker are involved with who have mental health problems or who have learning disabilities, uh, who are parents, um, or who have other uh, challenges in their lives that actually makes it much, much more difficult for them to meet the demands that is expected of them within the new system. And that's where I'm most concerned, is that it, it, it's, it's a bit like so much of public policy making. It's the most vulnerable um, that I suppose, in effect, the benefit system's meant to be there to give the security, who seem to be the ones who are not getting the security from it. Um, and that, 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 for me, is, is, is where we need to still do better in terms of joint working around that. It's helpful, Mr Guy, and it, perhaps it can also help to clarify, I wasn't quite clear in response to questions from Mr Stewart. I mean, do you believe the welfare system should operate without sanctions, or is it you have concern about the way the sanctions are operating? The, the well, for me, it's clearly, um, any welfare system of any type um, has to have a, a dialogue and an engagement with people who are receiving the welfare. There has to be just good social work is about achieving changes in behaviour. It's just not about maintaining dependency. Um, but um, the, uh, clearly at the moment, the, I think has been well described by my colleagues, the impact of the sanctions tends to fall disproportionately on those who are least able to uh, deal with the difficulties that that then uh, puts them in. And that's the problem we have with the system as it currently stands. Do with issues of operation? I mean, I was just genuinely interested in, in whether you wanted to see a welfare system without sanctions. That's a, that's a matter of public policy, really. I think uh -huh. that... In any system of any service has some, some degree of uh, expectation. It's a two-way process. Um, the difficulty with a benefit system is that um, th th where you have sanctions, and the way it operates is that the sanctions fall on those who are least able to, 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 to deal with the impact of them. And that's, mm -hmm. the, that's clearly, as yet, in the development of this new set of service, this new process and this new policy, as the change process unfolds, the people who are being most impacted are those who are least able to deal with the impacts of it. And that's, that's my primary concern. And does Mr Gaw's view reflect the three of you? I've, I've, I've worked in welfare rights for nearly 30 years and there's always been uh, an element of sanctions. Uh, originally it was a, a six-week suspension of benefit and a reduced rate of income support for those who were seeking work. But what we've seen is an expansion of, of sanctions. Sanctions now fall on uh, lone parents, on those who are unfit for work and on carers. And that's perhaps taking the, the sanction policy a, a, a step too far. 
Uh, could, have lost my, could have lost my thread there, sorry. I just intervene here. Um, we're straying a wee bit away from children's services. I, mean, we, well, I, I understand that, but, just but to help clarify, the, just yes. to help clarify, the committee has already undertaken an inquiry into sanctions, and we all have unanimous agreement that there has to be some form of conditionality in any uh, system, and that the concerns were around the practical implications and the criteria for the current sanction system. So if we can all accept that that's the position we're starting from, any other questions you've got on the issue, Annabelle, carry on. No, that's helpful, Convener, and thank you. It was really <coughs> because Mr Stewart questioned perfectly legitimately fairly extensively on sanctions. I was interested in, in just clarifying one or two, one or two points. Um, Going back to something that uh, Mr. Gore said, which was, and it was an interesting observation because um, food banks are a contentious issue, on the one hand praised for being there, on the other hand um, a subject of concern that they have to be there. But you indicated that actually in terms of being a source of helping some people to be referred or signposted to other services, um, they had a positive role in that respect, you think your phrasing was they're getting better at doing that. I mean, is this something that from your different areas, all food banks are good at doing or is it something they, they could be assisted in doing better? I think they are getting better. I, I think that Alistair's um, depiction of, of what's happening in Edinburgh has certainly been replicated in, in, in North Ayrshire. I think that um, we have certainly seen a, a much closer link between the food bank staff and and the, the wider support services that are available and, and, and they're picking up. It, it, the, the, the difficulty, I suppose, is that it's, it's not an early... It, the earliest stage we would like, because the fact that people are having to present at a food bank in the first place is, is probably a stage where they are in a, a degree of crisis and, and really struggling. So ideally, what we would like to do is, is move away from people's reliance on food banks where at all possible, but I recognise we're a long way shy of that. I think as a, as a result of um, the nature of people coming along, they are identifying um, quite quickly that there may be additional vulnerabilities beyond just the, the, the financial elements and, and we're, we're getting support for those individuals. So. Thank you, Convener. Okay. Uh, Christina, to be followed by Joan. Thank you very much, uh, Convener. I've, I've really, um, I was going to say enjoyed, but probably not enjoyed um, all your evidence so far. I think it's been very, very enlightening and actually uh, quite heart sore with some of it, to be honest. Um, the Child Poverty Action Group have developed an early warning system um, and I know that many of the local authorities have taken part in that, and especially welfare rights officers. Um, and they've identified a, a number of areas, of, they've used about 900 cases using different seminars and different ways of gathering that information. But they, they've identified a number of areas, which I'll just highlight very quickly to you, that there's been an increase in demand for information, which you've confirmed today in advocacy services. The services have, inc have increased contact with families experiencing income crisis, which, which you, you've talked about today as well. Um, increased evidence of families unable to access basic services as a result of financial barriers, and that there has been a reluctance in some families to engage with public services for fear of being classed as neglectful. Um, some very, very uh, um, keen and, and hard areas in that to, to, to deal with. I'm just wondering if you could maybe give me any information on some of those areas. Um, I think in particular that one of the ones that I wanted to focus what on was the instance uh, what increased evidence of families unable to access basic services. And I think many of you this morning have given us uh, examples of the impact on families with children who have disabilities. Um, and I know that the point has been made that, you know, it's less likely for those benefits to be impacted upon. But if the parents' benefits have been impacted on, then, you know, the, the opportunities are, are then lessened. Um, so I'd be very keen to hear about any you know, information or, you know, update you've got on and how, how you've managed that. One of the case studies is um, a family couldn't afford to take, to take their child for a regular healthcare check 
at the local hospital and how the local authority had to step in and help them with that. And I wonder if you've got any examples of that and maybe ways that you've helped resolve that for families. Yes. One of the issues in, in, in North Ayrshire last summer, our um, KA Leisure, who run all of the, the swimming facilities, etc., the gyms, um, had... Um, essentially opened up their pools to, to, to children to attend um, free swimming lessons, free use of the pool, and um, astoundingly the use over the summer was less than it had been the previous year. And um, we did a lot of head scratching around that and, and, and began to ask questions about it. And the more we spoke to parents that we work with, um, it, it, Free use of the pool was, was well and good, but actually buying swimming costumes for the children, the, the transport to and from the pool, you know, a cup of coffee whilst the, the, the kids are in, all beyond um, what parents could do. So, so actually, again, you know, something that we thought was, was fairly good and, and, and would have been a useful initiative, the uptake was, was way below what we would have expected. And I think what we're hearing back from parents was it was just a step too far. And so it was... It, it was not just about the free use of the pool. That, that was never going to do it. I think your question, it, it, it's interesting around parents affected by disability and, and being, being um, reassessed because at the moment we might say, well, actually, it doesn't appear to be having an impact on people. The reason for that would be is because the, the slow pace at which that is happening. So, you know, it, it would be unfair to say, well, actually, it's not having an effect. The reason it's not having an effect is it hasn't happened yet. Uh, or it's happened very, in, in very small numbers. So we, we're not necessarily getting a true picture of the impact that it will have or it's beginning to have. So I, I'm, I'm not able to answer that question in an honest way other than uh, it's minimal at the moment because it's not happening much, if, if, if you understand my, my rationale. You know, I can't say it's a major drama because of the, 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 the slow rate at which the assessments are happening. Well, g given that, given that, that Highland was obviously a pilot area for universal credit, are you finding more parents come in looking for self-directed support packages in order to support maybe children with disabilities in the family? We're certainly putting a focus on self-directed support and... Um, I, I'm not able to necessarily link the two at the moment, I, you know, but that would be an interesting one to go and look at, actually, yeah. Yeah, um, well, 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 I, think it, I think it would yeah. be. Um, any other comments? Well, well, I they, don't necessarily have examples of, of good practice from the Glasgow area, and that's just because I'm a welfare rights worker and not familiar with the, what's happening in education and leisure, etc. But something I would uh, highlight is that the, although children aren't impacted by some of the changes, yes, you're correct, a sanctioned family is a sanctioned family and the child within that family will bear the, the brunt of that also. But in relation to the, the DLA changes, when a child of 16, a disabled child of 16 claims DLA, then they will need to claim personal independence payment and in all likelihood the level of personal independence payment that will be payable after the 16th birthday will be less than was payable prior to the 16th birthday and as resources within households are, are pooled and shared that will be a loss to the, to the whole household. There's a further barrier and that is that it's the whole DLA to personal independence payment migration and this affects not just the children turning 16 but adults who are on DLA as well that, that, that the system is unrealistically cumbersome that you'll be contacted by letter and invited to make a phone call for personal independence payment to indicate you wish to make a claim. You'll do part of your claim over the telephone. You'll then be sent a form to be completed and returned. And that, for, 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 for folk who maybe aren't au fait with forms or the whole bureaucratic process, that's just a barrier to, to maintaining benefit. I think it will be fair to say that anybody today in receipt of DLA would quite like to receive the successor benefit and they should not need to have an invitation to make a phone call to start a claim to receive a claim form that in the way that DLA uh, is renewed that at the expiry, in advance of expiry, you're sent a renewal pack to complete and return. If you choose not to return it then, or you're unable to return it, it impacts on benefits. But here we now have a, a letter, a phone call, a claim form and for for, for social work resources, people are trying to support those households. It's not simply a case if we go out to someone, oh, you should be getting this benefit. Here we've got a claim form, we can fill it in. It's a case of having to phone up, 
to request the form, to have it sent out, to have a repeat journey. And uh, so double visits in many cases. And just while I'm on this bandwagon, that in the event that the DLA is not converted to a similar ward of PIP, if there's home care services, chargeable services going into that household, then not only is there a loss to the individual, there's also a loss to social work uh, revenue through their charging policies. Just just on that, that process and that whole thing, and I just was spent two hours with a constituent yesterday at our home trying to sort all this out for her. Um, there's a young carer involved in that family, and it's a young carer that usually has a responsibility for a lot of this, and I don't know whether you know, you've picked up any um, evidence um, or any examples where um, the impact on young carers has been greater um, than it maybe has been in the past. I have examples, but, but quite obviously if there's less income into the household, then the ability of that household to cope, regardless of who the, 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 the principal carer is, is going to be... Is that an example, and the same with the, the, the self-directed support one, where the Ch Child Poverty Action Group's early warning system would, may, would maybe be able to start gathering some of that evidence and, and that information, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. OK, um, Harry Stevenson, who I know very, very well in South Lanarkshire, his children are my constituents, um, and, I, and I deal with him every, every day of the week. And part of his letter, he said, living in poverty creates long-term difficulties for these children who grow up at a greater risk of mental health, chronic illness, unemployment and homelessness. So the cycle continues and starts again. And I think uh, Stephen Brown mentioned in his opening remarks about adults in distress and the impact that that has. Now, I had 19 years in social work before I came into politics, and I have to say the transferable skills have been very, very valuable indeed. But at that point, you know, for every pound that was spent on a child in an early year situation, it was nine pounds saved out of the system as an adult. And I wonder, has that figure changed? Has that become, you know... One pound spent on every child is eighteen pounds saved at the system at a later date, or is that one pound now spent on a child of less value than it was then? <coughs> Alistair, maybe. I, uh, I, 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 I mean, the, 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 a number of those types of figures are mentioned, aren't they? These ratios of one to nine or one to twelve or, or, yeah. or, or whatever. Um, I, I think that um, we've made an, a number of points this morning about the value of early intervention, and uh, I think there's there's no doubt that. Um, if you can have children uh, in, in, a, in a way that, that they are ready, readiness for school, if, if, if a child can start school it, it reasonably achieving milestones um, as the rest of the children in the class, then th th the opportunities of them are far, far greater. And obviously, um, GERFEC um, and the framework around that and the Early Years Collaborative has got some very specific goals around those targets um, and, and, and I think if we could all focus in a joined up way on achieving those targets that could actually make a real difference yeah. um, and that's not just about the household income it's about much more than that but there's a huge amount of literature um, public writers like Harriet Ward the NCH um, a lot of the stuff that the Child Poverty Action Group draws on and um, there's robust evidence that if children are growing up in poverty um, the, the outcomes for these children are significantly poorer um, and they then are able to make much less of a contribution in the longer term. So whatever ratio you put on that of 1 to 9, 1 to 12, 1 to 18, the, the, the lesson is the same, I think. Yeah. Mr Brown, have you, did you have a... Yeah, I suppose just to reiterate what Alistair was saying, I, I, I think um, there is inevitably, and I think the Child Poverty Action Group have, have, have done a lot of work around this and, and are very clear about um, if we don't get it right for children in poverty within those first five years, by the time they are beginning primary school, they are between 10 and 13 months behind in terms of readiness for attainment than um, children who are not born into poverty and, and, and brought up in that environment. So the Early Years Collaborative has certainly um, focused on that. But again, Again, the impact of parental mental ill health on, on children and living with that day in, day out, um, it's very difficult. And I know there's been a lot of financial modelling about if we spend a pound here and how much will that save in the longer term. But actually, I, I'm, I'm never convinced that, um, that, that the figures can be entirely accurate because it's not an exact science. And when you build in the impact on the NHS services, on the Scottish prison service, and, and you begin to build all that together, I, I suspect. They may even be higher than, than 1 to 18, but that's uh, just a personal view, I suppose. Yeah. 
Yeah, Miss Kinsella, would you were nodding away there. Yeah, I don't know if you wanted I, to add anything. No, I, I was just thinking of um, it was it was around um, multi-agency involvement and thinking about um, the balance between uh, the right to privacy and uh, multi-agency work. So that, for instance, when we were trying to seek to identify those people who would be most affected by the benefit cap. Now, housing had that information, you know, because they could see where, where the housing benefit was paid. Um, and that might have been of interest to, to social work. But it was quite right that we didn't necessarily know those names. But what they were able to say was, uh, and because, you know, communities are small, they were able to identify those communities where some of those people would be and for social work then to check their system to see whether or not they needed additional support because, you know, <coughs> and, and I, in preparing for this, I asked uh, social work teams, did they have anybody on their books who were identified um, as being affected by the benefit cap? And there are 20 families in Highland affected and I know for sure that two of them are definitely uh, known to one social work team. So that shows, I think, the level of... Um, and uh, some didn't get back to me, and one or two definitely didn't. You know, it's a mixed bag. But I, I just think it's quite right that we maintain people's privacy and data protection is there. But we need to think about how how we can use the system, how how we can use the information that we hold to ensure that families get the yeah. right support yeah. that they that they need. Yeah. I, I, I mean, ab absolutely, I understand the sensitivities within yeah. sharing the data and stuff like that. Um, you know, but to to have a truly holistic approach to a family, you know, to, to help them is is, is very, very important. And that sort of gives me a, a very nice segue into my, my, my second last question, convener, um, on uh, the, uh, the issue around about in-work poverty. You know, and you've got these children, you know, who maybe have, have limited opportunities, who then become the parents of the future, and the, the impact that then has them, them, on them and the ability to earn and the, the opportunities that they, they can then have for, for jobs. And the Resolution Foundation uh, printed a, a paper in... in uh, December last year and, and one thing that they said if we really want to help working families and low and middle incomes boosting the work allowances would be more effective and better value for money than any tax cuts we talk a lot about tax cuts especially in the last few weeks we've talked a lot about tax work the report goes on to state that a thousand pound increase in the work allowances available to a single parent earning twelve thousand pounds would boost their income by sixty five six hundred and fifty pounds per year but in contrast a thousand pound increase in personal allowances would benefit them by just £70 a year. And I don't know whether you've managed to do any modelling on that or whether there's been any impact, you know, that that, that would have. But um, I'm sure you would you would understand that, you know, some of the, the impacts on actual people who are in work um, and having to claim benefit as well. Because we do have, you know, a bit of a, a low pay economy. And although we're being told, you know, we're in recovery, you know, the distance between high earners and low earners is, is, has, has increased rather than, you know, got any better along with, you know, um, this recovery that we're all experiencing. Um, and I just wondered whether you had any information on that, anything that you could give us to, to, to you know, help us understand that a bit better. I'm looking uh, at you. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> just still trying to, to, to formulate an answer. That if you increase, if we allow folk to retain more of their benefit before it starts to taper away, then they keep. So, for example, if, you're, if you thresholds were increased by twenty pound, then that's twenty pound more in their pocket. Yeah. Whereas making a similar increase to tax <laughs> thresholds, then they'll still pay a percentage of their a percentage the twenty percent. Uh, so I, I'm not sure if that's where, where that comes from. Yeah, but obviously, yeah. obviously, there's something within the mechanics of it that means that if you put it in one place, they get to retain more of it. Put it in another place, then they don't get to see it all. And I can only imagine that's because of of taper systems. Uh -huh. Now, the taper system on or our benefit system presently is that if you're working and getting housing benefit and council tax reduction, then for every pound you earn, then 65 pence comes off your housing benefit and 20 pence comes off your council tax reduction and you're left with 15 pence. So if your boss comes and gives you an extra tenner, you only get to see £1.50 of that because of the way the tapers work. However, if you increase the threshold so that if the boss came and gave you an extra tenner, you've got to keep the tenner, then yes, that would be to, to the person's advantage and not only to the person's advantage, but to the economy's yeah. advantage yeah, because every, every pound that's given in benefits by and large, every pound by and large, there's a contradiction, right? Every, but benefit money doesn't get spent too far from the local community. 
So it helps the, ho the whole economy. And we had done a piece of work with Fraser of Allen, the Research Institute, on the, the loss of benefits. And they concluded that if Glasgow were to lose £112 million per annum because of the, the benefit changes, which we feel was a kind of like erring on the, the size of caution, that there'd be nearly 2,000 jobs lost in the Scottish economy, of which 1,300 would be from Glasgow. So uh, and that's, this is Fraser Vander, and it mm -hmm. might be a, mm -hmm. a report that, that the committee would wish, wish to see. It's, it's quite a complicated one, and I know I put you on the spot a bit there on, on, on that, um, but it's, it's something I think that you know we have to... If we're serious about bringing people out of poverty, then it's something we need to look at. You know, you know, cuts to you know um, tax rates and stuff. Uh, if they don't work for people, then we need to you know acknowledge that and look at other ways of doing that. But it takes me on to you know what's what's planned for the future, and it is my final question, convener. Um, the 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 plans for the future, and you know, uh, on the radio this morning, I heard. You know, a politician say that the future for welfare is um, child benefit only being paid to two children in the family. So the first two children, so if you have more than two children, no child benefit. And actually a way to save, I think it's £12 billion worth of more cuts, is to take it from in-work benefits. Um, and it was just your, your thoughts on that and the impact that that would then have on all of the individuals. As I say, as Harry Stevenson's children are my constituents, I see it every day that the impact they have. That further impact, I dread to think what that would do to, to people. The, quite, quite clearly then, taking that level of money from people, then they themselves will be worse off. But our economies will be worse off because that's money that's not going into our local shops, uh, etc. Over and above that, where folk are no longer able to afford childcare, then they'll look to their extended family or even their neighbours to try and provide some of that childcare. So while you know, there might be households out there who feel that they are completely immune from benefits, if we could actually tr trace the, the, the benefit pound through, through the economy, we'd be so quite surprised as to, to where it actually ends up. And uh, the, the withdrawal of that money, the implication for folk, as I say, would be perhaps you know, neighbours asked to look after their children because they can't afford the childcare any longer. So that... that those further cuts do worry me. Yeah, Mr. Brown. Absolutely, I, I, I think we've heard a lot today about the the emerging um, increase in demand for services across the, the, the public sector and, I, and and the third sector, and um, I, I think that would that would only increase hugely as as a result of, of, of some of those proposals. I would have real concerns about it, and I, I suppose the the point to make, and in North Ayrshire, and I'm sure it's the same. It, it, Across the country, there are real pockets where uh, there are higher levels of child poverty and deprivation than, than other places, and um, communities are generally very resilient and will do whatever they can to help out. And, and uh, However, I, I think, and it goes back to my point much earlier on around the increase in destitution presentations, people no longer have the aunt or the uncle or the neighbour that they can go to for, you know, an emergency £20 just to tide them over to see, because actually there are communities now where everyone is in the same boat and everyone is struggling um, and, and they no longer have that reliance that they maybe once had and I think that brings additional pressures to the, the public sector and the third sector as well. So um, those types of proposals I, uh, will, will inevitably have an impact, I think. I, I think um, to, to go back to the focusing on, on, on children here, uh, I think I've already said that children, uh, if, they're good, if children are to be resilient and independent and self-sufficient, they need to mature into uh, people who can be independent and resilient and self-sufficient. And we all know that children only grow up to be that way if they have the basics, if they have the, secu the basic security um, and the predictability, and they have a life that's, that, that's, that, that, that's devoid of fear uh, and, and all the other bits of parenting and you know, a, a community that, that, that goes with that. Um, my, my, I've already expressed my concern, and I share it with Harry, that um, the changes that we're seeing at the moment are stripping away that security from children, which then stops them being able to grow into the resilient children that we want and the resilient people that we want. Um, and I think um, if, 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 if we go down this road further, we're just going to create more problems for ourselves. Um, that, that would be my, my, my response to your question. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I don't think... Uh, 
people set out to have difficult lives. No. People, when their child is born, hope for the best. And I think uh, the idea that somehow people um, live their, their complicated and vulnerable lives from choices is, 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 is misdirected. So, um, yes, it, it's, it's a, a difficulty that, that people face. And um, I don't think that um, reducing child benefit will necessarily um, do anything to help the vulnerable families. On that note, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Christina. Finally, Joan. I'd like to, to <coughs> continue with this um, 12 billion additional cuts figure because you know it does come from the UK government, so um, it's something that we we know is a is a, a serious risk. There was a, a leaked file um, uh, given to the BBC some time ago that suggested ways that these 12 billion pounds of cuts might might be obtained. Um, uh, my colleague um, Christina McKelvey has already talked about child benefit, but some of the suggestions in this leaked document were, for example, restricting carers' allowance to those eligible for universal credit. Um, and there was also a suggestion that DLA, PIP and attendance allowance would no longer be tax-free. And there was also a suggestion of regional benefit caps. And I just wondered what your reflections were on the impact if, if those options were taken up because we haven't been told where these twelve billion pound of cuts are going to come from in the welfare budget. But if it cut if it did come from one of those areas, how would you see the impact being on the people that you deal with in particular families? It's come from and someone's going to have to have less money. And unfortunately the most vulnerable in society are clients of social work services. So the majority of social work services have an entitlement to one or more state benefits. So wherever the cuts fall, it will be an additional responsibility at the end of the day for, for social work services, be it children's services, older people or physical disability, mental health. And I think one of the issues here is that that's a leaked document. It might not come to pass. But I think what we started off saying is that the anxiety that um, emerges from, from this sort of information or, 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 or rumour um, is, is very distressing to, to, to vulnerable tenants or vulnerable clients. And at the same time, it, it can cause anxiety amongst services because thinking, right, OK, how do we cope with this? So th there's a very practical um, response of, of people who may well be affected. But there's the other side, which I think we've all indicated, is the anxiety that that sort of rumour, speculation or fact, we don't know, can cause for folks. So that, that's almost, it's not, it's not as distressing, clearly, as not having so much money, but it is very distressing um, and time-consuming. Yeah, I'm just t touching those, I think the, I mean, I have to say that as yet, um, certainly in the City of Edinburgh, we've not really felt the impact of the benefits cap. That's not something that's come to, to prominence here in relation to, to children. Certainly taxing uh, DLA, PIP, or tenants allowance um, will mean that put more pressure on those, on those families. And similarly, uh, restricting the availability of carers allowance is likely to do the same. Um, where we do have larger families, um, limiting child benefit in the way described um, clearly would again reduce the family income. So these would exacerbate the, 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 the pressures that we've already discussed and probably lead to a bit more cost shunting, probably lead to a bit more pressure in some families that may end up with children coming into the care system, which of course is much more expensive. Also, in terms of this 12 billion cut, politicians are, um, in the current government have suggested that uh, a couple of times in the media recently that disabled people will not be affected. Do you think that's do you think that's credible to suggest that you could get 12 billion pounds of cuts from the welfare budget without affecting disabled people? People are already affected by, by the cuts yeah. and uh, the large part of those cuts are still to happen. Yeah. The, the migration of the transfer of DLA to PIP uh, is still to land. So uh, the original ch plan for the, the change was part of the original cost-saving exercise. So uh, un undoubtedly folk will have less money from those changes. To I don't see how it's possible to 
cut, even if it's by way of tax, those benefits then say that, that won't have an impact on the, the end recipient, that those, those things don't add up, unless that person has so, so much income that they're, they don't notice the difference, but uh, the folk that we're working with don't have those levels of money. And just if I could ask um, Social Work Scotland, in terms of the, uh, the migration from DLA to PIP, in your written evidence you say that as PIP doesn't include any replacement for the lowest care component of DLA, those with less visible needs are likely to lose out and substantially fewer people are likely to receive <coughs> PIP enhanced rate and mobility <coughs> component that would have received the equivalent DLA component resulting in isolation and increased pressure on social work and health services. Is that something you're seeing evidence of already, or is it something you're it's, planning it's, for? We, we've not seen it already, but as Richard was saying, that's something that's in the pipeline. But yeah. um, yes, we're having to plan for that. It doesn't necessarily directly affect children, of course. This is this is across the population, but that is one of the concerns that Richard's just, just described. Yeah. If I could maybe come in just... At present, if someone gets the lower rate care component of DLA, they are then protected from non-dependent deductions. So they may be living in a house with their son or daughter. Uh, at, they're protected from the non-dependent deduction. The loss of the DLA uh, component will, com will pale into insignificance in comparison to the level of the non-dependent deduction that could be applied. Uh, and, uh, I've got some figures here. I'll not trouble you with them at the moment, but uh, someone on the minimum wage, I think that the loss would be is like £45 a week, if not more. So yes, you'll lose your your £14-£15 DLA, but in addition, you would then have applied to you uh, an independent deduction. And if you had two such adults in the house, then it would be double that. Very substantial cut. And also in the, that same Social Work Scotland submission, it talks about the impact on unpaid adult carers. Of this is uh, over 650,000 unpaid adult carers, and uh, as a result of the loss of the da daily living component, I, I wondered if you were able to say a little bit more about the impact on unpaid carers. Well, I, I, again, uh, Richard can probably give you some detail on the, the, the technicalities around it, but. Um, I think already, and what's probably possibly not well understood, is that a massive amount of the day-to-day -day care and support that's given to families is done without any support. It's done voluntarily. It's done by extended family members and neighbours or, 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 or um, whatever, and primarily when it comes to children uh, by, by parents, particularly of disabled children. Um, and um, the... The changes in allowances that will have that impact will undoubtedly put additional stress on those families. Um, we're doing a lot of work, particularly through self-directed support, to try and uh, ameliorate um, some of those problems and look at what packages of care we can put together. And there's a, a really fundamental contra contrast between the the, 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 f the framework, the thinking, the policy and, and the principles behind something like self-directed support and the application of the benefit system. It couldn't be more stark, really, that um, you're trying to deal with many of the same issues. Um, but self-directed support is all about choice and empowerment, um, which is the exact opposite of the radical changes that we're seeing in the benefit system. And the two things are a huge, uh, huge contrast and strike me as being um, a real example of where policy can be very, very incoherent. Um, I don't know if in the technical bits of that, Richard, you could... Un unpaid carers, I think unemployed carers in that sense, uh, will claim a carer's allowance depending on the person they're caring for getting middle or higher rate care component of DLA. If they get the carer's allowance, then there's uh, some relaxation of the requirement to, to seek employment. If the person they care for fails to transfer from DLA to PIP, then the person who cares for will lose the carer's allowance they will then need to claim job seekers allowance and with job seekers allowance will be the requirement to to participate in the work seeking activities. Now the reality may be, you know, that the need for care hasn't diminished in any shape or form, but the, the goalposts have moved. Thank you very much. Okay. Um just to finish off, can I ask one question? I, th I hope I'm not being unfair, Alistair, but I'm going to direct this at you because I think it does cover uh, the whole of uh, Scotland, it's, it's uh, an issue that's coming to us from organisations right across Scotland, and it's, so it's a general question. But it's about uh, service planning 
uh, are about the level of consultation with organisations um, who are being impacted and are involved in, in this area. Under the, the Children and Young Peoples Act, there is a, a requirement for children's service plans. Um, can you reassure the, the organisations and people out there that, that these plans are um, being developed with an understanding of welfare reform as, at the heart of it and in consultation with, with those who are affected? I, 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 can say, I, I certainly can for the City of Edinburgh. Um, um, but um, I think, I mean, oh, clearly the new children's services plans are 16, 17 onwards, so we're, we're a couple of years away from that yet, so there's time to, to get this process absolutely right. But um, most authorities, I'm sure, and Stephen may comment on this as well, are uh, with currently produced integrated children's services plans uh, based on previous legislation, um, which are very much part of the community planning structure. So, uh, for example, in the city of Edinburgh, we would have the people around the table who uh, have the capacity to deal with those issues. That, that goes well beyond the local authority. It includes the health service. It includes the voluntary sector. Um, on the specific issue of, of the uh, uh, welfare reform, um, most integrated children's services plans will have a, a strategic objective around poverty. Um, we certainly do in the city of Edinburgh. Um, so we might have uh, be trying to do some work in a joined up way around early years, some work around attainment for looked after children. But an equally important um, element of any children's services plan would be uh, what we're doing to address poverty uh, and the impact of poverty. And, the, and it's, the, it's the, the lens of the community planning partnership that really can get to grips with that. It's not something that local authorities can do on their own. So my brief answer to your question is it's already happening in many places and, and certainly in Edinburgh. Um, and I think that looking ahead to, to, to the new plans, um, I think the pressures that are in the pipeline that we've discussed at some length this morning will inevitably mean that this is going to be at the forefront of people's priorities uh, as we go forward. So um, I think my answer to that is a resounding yes. Um, that will be very much part of the, 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 the future. Okay. As I said, I did direct the year. It was a general question. We're up against the clock, so can I just leave it at that point and accept that? Um, as, as uh, your answer on behalf of everyone else, because I saw everyone else nodding as you were, as you were speaking. So um, I don't think we're going to get any dissent uh, from from the position that you outlined, and I thank you uh, very much for it. Um, and thank you for the evidence that you've given us this morning. A lot of it was hard to hear, but it was important that we heard it. I just hope that other people elsewhere pay attention to the messages that are coming out from people like yourselves who are at the cool face of, of these changes. Um, so thanks very much for enlightening us this morning on this very important issue. Thank you. And while uh, our witnesses are leaving, I'll just point out our next meeting on the 5th of May, where we expect to hear your say evidence from a range of PIP recipients and consider the committee's annual report. And with that, I will bring the public part of the meeting to a close.